Hello, everyone, and welcome to the fifth anniversary special of the Jake's Take with Jacob Elishar podcast. I am your host, Jacob Elishar, the chief content producer and writer of jakestake.com, a pop culture entertainment news website. Before we get started, please like this video if you're watching, and please subscribe to my YouTube channel, which is on below right over here. And also, if you're listening to this on any of our audio platforms, please download this episode and more episodes as soon as you're done with the recording. And also, please give a five-star rating. Five years, the fifth anniversary. I never thought I would get to five years. I can think of so many of the incredible guests come flashing to my mind. I want to thank Brett Walgamon, who started us, the pilot episode. And I never imagined the people, the reality TV legends, the Emmy-winning journalists, the publicists, and every and YouTube content creators that have cut authors who and fitness entrepreneurs who came onto this platform over the past five years. Thank you all for all my guests who have made an appearance on my podcast. I really appreciate it. And most of all, thank you to all of the publicists that have trusted me with your clients. I really am grateful that you chose the Jake's Take with Jacob as your platform for, for to have conversations. And just like every episode before this fifth anniversary, I want to bring on a very special guest. Now, this man and I have known each other, have been digital pen pals for the past 13 years. James Sizemames, my guest today, has made his appearance on his pot on my platform four unique times. This will be his very first un time on the podcast. And I got to tell you about James. He is the, he's an Australia-based author, musician, entrepreneur, and graphic artist and creative superhero. And he's the author of The Marvelous Mobilos, Only Wear Blues. So please help me welcome for a very special episode of this podcast, my good friends, James, sit the name, sit the podcast. Hello, my friends. How are you going? James, it is an honor to have you here. I never thought when I started my blog years ago that we would be sitting down to celebrate the fifth anniversary of the podcast. Uh, absolutely. And look, as I said to you earlier, I have to thank you before we begin and move any, any forward because to be invited to be your guest in the fifth year anniversary is a real special honor, especially given the wonderful company that you've had for so many years. Um, and as you mentioned before, we have been digital pen pals, really, haven't we, in the new age and Having known each other for so long and having such a, a rich relationship for many years, it's a great honor. Um, congratulations, my friends. I wish you five more years, 10 more years, 50 more years. Do this until the end of time. But congratulations. And it's a great honor and a great blessing. And I'm very grateful to be here with you. Thank you so much, James. I really appreciate it. And you are very welcome. Guys, you're so welcome. And guys... It has been five years since you, James made his last appearance on the Jake's Take plat with Jacob Elisha platform. It was 2019, and this whole world has turned upside down. So, James, the last, it's been 29, five years since you last week. So, how have you grown as creator? So, this is our last conversation back in 2019. Yeah, it, it's a great question. I think, firstly, I'm bald now. So that's a big change. <laughs> that's not necessarily a creative change, but it's certainly a change. So I've done the opposite of growing there. Um, but look, I, I'd say I have grown, but I think a more appropriate term would be probably to say that I've changed. Um, you know, I'm a big believer in the implication of personal circumstances, you know, especially as a creative. And so I think the things that happen to us, you know, in our everyday lives often dictate a number of the creative decisions that we make or, they at least become a, a catalyst for those creative decisions, right? And so, as you know, I first kind of entered into the land of creativity as a, you know, an R&B and a hip hop music producer in my early teens. And that was because I had such a great affinity for music. Um, and I still have that same affinity and that same love in my heart. But I have been experimenting in recent years, as you recall, from 2019 with cinematic scoring and production and library audio for advertising and all those really fun things. And kind of just trying to find a way to monetize my time. Um, you know, it, it's such a competitive landscape, R&B production and hip hop production that it isn't necessarily a lucrative venture for me. Um, I'm fortunate enough to have a, a really successful business that takes care of that. So I kind of wanted to enter into a venture where 
I was creating music for the love of it and for the fun. Um, but a lot of that kind of comes out of, you know, scarcity and we all can relate to that scarcity of time, scarcity of resources. And as you, as you know, and as you mentioned three years ago, I had my first little boy, uh, Dante, um, who's yet three years old and growing and thriving is just a, a little angel. Um, and so that's changed my life in a multitude of ways. And I guess when once upon a time I could crank up these speakers here that you can see behind you and make all sorts of noise and ruckus and, and just create can't really do that anymore right because I've got a, a napping baby or a sleeping kid or something like that so I've had to kind of have a bit of a, a shift in the way that I create um, and because I've been time for time poor I've sort of moved across into writing screenwriting children's book writing as you know and just things that are a little bit more digestible as a family man with a laptop sitting on his lap watching trash tv reruns <laughs> so it's kind of, yeah, I've had a shift where instead of sitting in this room and spending a lot of time isolated in here, hours upon end, I'm kind of taking that creativity into a more um, communal space um, and trying to create in ways that allow me the flexibility to still be there for my family, um, but still connect with what I fell in love with, and that's creativity. And that's amazing. And that gives me back to the semi days of the podcast. James, for those of you who yes. have followed me throughout my years, starting 2011, James was what, aka Simi, was one of the very first guests on my platform. I was indeed, yes. And look, it's, yeah, I wish I missed that name, Simi. I missed that name. It's just sort of one of those names that I hear still, still in the musical circles with old, old family, old friends, old guests, old partners. Um, you know, being in such a professional world now, I don't get it often, but when I hear it, it really brings that nostalgia out and uh, it's really cool. So it's a great reminder. Absolutely. So you spoke, spoke about two organizations and companies that you've created. I mean, Imagi Works Agency and Vision Lens Technologies. For, now they're well known in Australia, but however, they're not well known to parts in the US. So can you describe these organizations to my audience? Yeah, absolutely. So look, by nature and as a virtue of, you know, my creative background, I am a marketing guy. Most creatives, you know, have a connection with marketing in a professional sense. And so when I went to, um, we call it university here, but college for you guys, when I started out there, um, I studied marketing and music as a double degree. And as a result of that, I founded ImagiWorks, which was a full service marketing creative agency. And that was obviously born out of my passion for creativity and Frankly, as I said, just trying to find a way to monetize coming up with ideas. <laughs> and um, that also sort of led me into Vision One. Vision One actually is a family business that my dad started about 26 years ago now. Um, and we are an audio visual technology integrator. So what that means is we sort of deal with uh, anything immersive from LED technologies, interactive touchscreen technologies, edge blended projectors, sound systems, all these sorts of different things. And it's sort of funny when I, you know, I would have been eight or nine years old when my dad founded the company. And um, I think I didn't understand at the time, but there was actually a natural correlation between what Vision One was doing and what I love to do. And that was audio, visual and marketing um, and just being able to generate new ideas. Right. And so I, I had this love for the medium of audio and visual. And I realized that Vision One was the organization that I kind of wanted to pursue. And so while ImagiWorks still exists in a sense, and I do a couple of little things here and there, most of my time is spent heavily invested in growing the business and developing uh, the business, which I'm obviously incredibly proud of. Um, and that gives me a chance to kind of blend those passions of audio and visual storytelling and technology and branding and creativity. Um, and mostly, most importantly, just building on those relationships. And so, yeah, that's kind of where Vision One has been for me. That's amazing. That's amazing. And I got to say this, kudos to you for joining a family business. Unfortunately, carpeting was in our, my family business. So my brother, Aaron and I, years ago, we, when we went out with our dad, when he was on a job site visits and assisted him, both Aaron and I took our heads, shook our heads. And at 14 and 13, we said, dad, we admire you. We love you yep. and we love your work, but we do not see ourselves in flooring. <laughs> yes, I, I look, I get it. And I, uh, I, I know a lot of people that are in that same boat. Um, I think that's the wonderful thing is that I was really fortunate in the end that my dad got into an industry that organically I just fell in love with without really realizing it. Um, so it's cool to have that overlap, but 
yeah, certainly I think if my dad was like an accountant, I probably wouldn't have done it. <laughs> yeah. Not to say anything yeah. about accountants. <laughs> We all need good accounts, but however, I think both of us rely more on creativity than algebra. Absolutely. Definitely. <laughs> There's greater alignment oh. there for sure. Absolutely. So I want to say a big congratulations on your release of your new children's book, The Marvelous Mullah Blues, Only Wear Mullah Blue. Blues, yeah. So where do you get the idea of the Mullah Blues? Yeah. Thank you so very much, Jacob. I appreciate it. And look, it's actually a really funny story. I conceived the idea like six years ago. So it's been in the works for a very long time. In fact, I think when we last spoke in 2019, I may have even mentioned to you that the idea was was, was there and I developed it, um, which kind of gives you a sense of how far back this goes. And I think I wrote the entire manuscript in like maybe a day or two. Um, but at the time, I, I don't think I was ready, uh, neither personally or professionally, to bring something like that into the world. Um, I was kind of dealing with the medium in different ways. And I don't think I had refined my craft enough, um, you know, to, to commit to something like that. And so, you know, like most creatives, I've always had a deep love for, for children's storytelling. You know, I could look around here and I'm not sure how much you can see, but I've got all, a thousand and one Funko Pops and all sorts of crazy toys. And like I could sit down and watch an episode of Scooby-Doo or the Flintstones or Mickey Mouse. And if I was with my three-year-old or I was by myself, I could do that perfectly comfortably now as a, you know, as a 33 year old. So it, it kind of transports my soul into a place of peace and tranquility and, and just general calmness. Um, and so I love children's storytelling and I've always been inspired by, you know, the Walt Disney's and Roald Dahl's. And I often try to say that I'm a bit of a Willy Wonka of everything that I do, you know, whether that's in business or whether that's in creativity. And so, I've always had a bit of a desire to create specifically for children um, and to deliver family entertainment to a degree. Um, I think we'll talk about it a little bit later, but I guess that's kind of where my Christmas screenplay comes from, that, that love for sharing stories with families and with children. And so I think everything I've ever done creatively was kind of to prepare me for this opportunity, um, you know, whether I was creating music for adult audience and that kind of became jingles and advertising or I was writing screenplays and drama for, for adults, which then became family films and animated films and children's books. So I've kind of had that natural shift um, and trend into an adjustment in the way that I tell my stories. But I think with the Muller Blues, I sort of wanted to write something a little bit um, like introspective, right? Something that kind of encouraged children to embrace their differences and to sort of just be proud of who they truly are, which I think is a super relatable message, especially today. Um, and ultimately through this journey, you know, the story kind of explores the themes of, of self-expression, um, of confidence, of the joys of being different. Um, and really it's just a, it's a playful reminder for children and parents to, you know, th there is beauty in kind of embracing who you are, um, even if it really means not fitting in with everybody else. So that's kind of, I suppose, what the book is about and how it was conceived in the very beginning. That's amazing. That's amazing. And he described the creation process of the mobile news from inception to release. Yeah. So look, like everything, it all starts with the idea. Um, I knew I wanted to write a children's book. Um, there are a billion different concepts that you can come up with for children's book storytelling. And so I needed to find something that resonated with me personally and something that I could be passionate about. Color is kind of a bit of an easy trope for children's books. And I love the color blue. I just have a natural affinity <laughs> for the color blue. I can't tell you why. I mean, we have a, I don't know how familiar you are. With I, I wore glasses for you. <laughs> there you go. You did. Thank you so much. I see that. Yeah. So I, I don't know if you're familiar with Thomas the Tank Engine. Um, was the oh, absolutely. I, there was a show on, absolutely. Thomas the Tank Engine was, it was a big part of me growing up because there was a show called Shine Time Station which actually featured George Carlin and Ringo Starr oh, of course. And Dee Dee yeah, as a conductor and Dee, Dee, and Dee Dee Khan playing Stacey Jones. So that's how uh -huh. I know Thomas. Absolutely. So look, Thomas was a big part of, you know, there is a crossbreed of culture between British culture and Australian culture, of course. Um, and so Thomas was a big part of my childhood and Thomas was blue, fell in love with blue. Um, you know, and so I think I did a little bit of research anyway, because I, I figured I just can't write a story because I like the color blue. Um, and I, I understood that there was a bit of an association with um, calmness and trustworthiness and intelligence. And so, uh, you know, I, I figured that would be kind of a great starting point. 
and you also see a lot of merchandise that's blue you know it seems to be a really popular color so look I, I think it, as i said it came from the idea conceived it six years ago wrote the manuscript within a couple of days and then it kind of sat and built up cobwebs on my hard drive for about four years not too dissimilar to a lot of beats that i've made over the last 15 years of my career um but that's where from that point where really kind of quote unquote taboo subject comes to play and that becomes artificial intelligence and so what i did again with my technology background and the fact that professionally um you know i have a passion for technology prior to this i reached out to a number of illustrators um you know obtained some quotes got some concepts but i just couldn't quite find the right fit or the right option the artist to capture the vision that i had and you know i am a little bit of a micromanager and can be quite possessive over my creative output like most creatives and so i decided that absolutely absolutely and so because of that i kind of committed to doing this alone um professionally i don't think i mentioned earlier but we work very heavily in the education market and so my network extends to early learning to childhood to um, child care centers classrooms so i've got quite a broad range of network as far as um, teachers and parents and students goes and so because of that i started to do some research in artificial intelligence um, look, I'm a pretty average drawer, if I'm being honest. For a creative, I'm not a great drawer. Um, and so what I basically did was I started to experiment with, with generative AI um, and began to explore ways that I could kind of bring these characters that I had in my, ingrained in my memory to life. And I recognise that, you know, it is quite a controversial subject um, and there's a ton of legislation obviously being written about this at the moment, you know, in regards to the fair use of AI. And I'm seeing that in all the industries I work in, whether that's screenwriting, whether that's design, uh, whether that's music. But, you know, I kind of see it like this as, as an Australian creative and, you know, having, you know, I, I've been very grateful that you followed my, my career up until this point. But I've always kind of been handicapped by a lack of resources or a lack of creative partners. You know, when I was producing beats, I was always reliant on a vocalist. You know, I had to wait for a vocalist to cut a vocal, or to write a vocal, to cut it, to send it back to me that process, you know, can be exhausting um, and can, it can take a long time and it really can hinder creativity and inspiration, you know, and, you know, when I was writing screenplays, as I still do, traditionally, you'd be reliant on a writer's room to generate information or to generate feedback or ideas. And, you know, with this book, I've become reliant on an illustrator to bring the vision to life. So it's kind of the old, like, you know, Steve Wozniak, Steve Jobs scenario, where you have a visionary, but you sort of need that person to execute that vision. But ultimately, Absolutely. without that vision, yeah, it doesn't it doesn't really have validity without the vision. Um, and so, you know, I don't know what your perspective is on, on AI and everybody has their opinion, which I think is terrific. I think the conversations need to be had and we're having this a lot um, in my professional sense. And I don't think it, it it's not something that directly replaces humans necessarily. I, I just think that it's, you know, it, it replaces humans that you have to you typically have to rely on with more reliable, greater performing versions of those humans. And so it allows us as creatives to expand our creativity. And as I experimented further and further with the technology, I'm sorry, I know this is a long winded way of giving you this answer, um, but you know, I began to build a vision board and all this consistency and you know, this process I'm not kidding took like 12 months, I think. Um, it's not just a case of give me the Muller blues and we're done, I'm talking refining the idea changing you know the way that their eyes were positioned and, and me digitally then at that point altering hair and colors and positions and backgrounds and all sorts of things and so there's still a large amount of creativity that kind of goes into that process and i suppose why i'm happy on about it is i feel really strongly because i've been challenged a little bit recently about this subject and i do think that you know this approach even though it is controversial, it is sensitive, I do think it's the next yes. step for creative enhancement. And I just think it makes creatives better um, in every way imaginable. Um, and I think, you know, art is one of those really unique things. Somebody, somebody told me very recently, he said, look, if art makes you feel something, then it is art. You know, it, that process is irrelevant. You know, there was a time and place where a photographer walked into a, a painting studio and took a photo of a mountain um and that person painting that same mountain turned to them and said you're not a real artist why would you just capture a photo of that you know i'm here and i'm painting this you know and and that kind of resonated quite a bit because it's a reflection of the way we're moving with technology and it's an understanding that 
there is a next phase in everything that we do. You know, same goes for, I mentioned before, children's media, traditional hand-drawn animators um, typically were, um, you know, against the idea of 3D rendering um, and three-dimensional Pixar-style animation. And so we've always kind of had this to and fro with animation, uh, with creative, excuse me, with creativity rather. Um, it's just, this is the first time that I've kind of been on the other end of that fence. And so, yeah, it's a really interesting conversation, um, but I just think history has a funny way of repeating itself. And I'm hopeful that, you know, with what I'm doing and, and everything that I do both personally, creatively and professionally, I'm hopeful that I'm on the cutting edge of something kind of significant. And yeah, it'll be interesting to see how we shift and move forward from here. Absolutely. And I believe you're on the cutting edge. And like, yeah, I get, I admit that I listened to Michael Jackson singing La Is La Bonita. And of course, I loved hearing Whitney Houston do Never Enough because in all honesty, Whitney would have been alive. I would have all, I would have handed her Never Enough to sing because that song yeah. went, was, perf was perfect for her. It lines up, doesn't it? And it's really interesting because, you know, those sorts of things have become really controversial because you're talking about reimagining things that are being performed by people that are no longer here, that there's a question mark as to whether or not they would have authorised that. And I kind of get that in a sense. Um, but ultimately, we've distorted history in so many ways through so many years. And, you know, the emergence of artificial intelligence is the same as the emergence of the internet. We create this fundamental shift in our um, our cultural psyche um, and the general hierarchy of society. And so I think it's really important to understand these things and not to be afraid of them, but, but to try to embrace them as best we can. And we talk about this a lot of work um, with a lot of our education partners and our school teachers. And, you know, we talk about a shift potentially um, surrounding the way that we're teaching and learning. You know, a lot of teachers have fear of what artificial intelligence means for them, but you know, I'm not sure what the, um, you know, the teaching prosperity is like in the US at the moment, but in Australia, our standards aren't that high. The quality of teaching isn't that high. And so all AI does is, you know, contributes to enhancing the ability of teachers to fundamentally deliver, you know, accurate practicums to students. And so, you know, I, I've been able to dabble in so many different industries and I get a sense of what that benefit is. Um, going back to the Muller Blues, you know, I mentioned about the illustrations and everything, but I would have had to, you know, I've been able to create like an animated sing-along song as part of my marketing pa uh, package. And for me to do that with an animator would have taken insurmountable months and an insurmountable cost that, to be perfectly honest with you, I, I don't have any intention of recouping. Um, you know, I, I'm not publishing this through a global publishing house that I expect to make millions of dollars, but I would love to be able to present this as professionally as possible. And so that opens up the door and the opportunity for me to do really cool things like that. And so I'm grateful as a creative um, who has been creating since he was 12 years old, but everybody has a different perspective, of course. Absolutely. We all need to have different perspectives. So we got to leave the mob blues behind because my friend, in addition to writing books, you've also written numerous screenplays that received semi-finalist and finalist status from various competitions including cover flies to red list. So I would love to talk about one of them, about some of them. Yeah, you, you tell me, which one did you want to talk about? Let's start with Dr. Claus, because I believe that's the family one that you mentioned earlier in our conversation. It is, yeah, yeah. So Dr. Claus was actually the very first screenplay that I wrote. Um, and I wrote that during COVID because I basically had a chance to understand the process of screenwriting. Um, we all had a bit of downtime and we had plenty of opportunities to develop our craft. Um, and so that was the first thing that I wrote and to kind of sum up very quickly, it's kind of the base, it's an inverse of a, you know, a traditional Santa Claus story in that it explores the relationship of a, uh, a clinically depressed Santa Claus um, and an egotistical, selfish kind of Scrooge like New York City therapist. Um, and he's treating him in the real world. So Santa kindly traverses from the North Pole to New York for, for these sessions. Um, but ultimately, it's really just like a story about love and loss and you know the journey of this therapist that he goes on with um kind of like a hand appointed junior alf from santa claus named penelope pilly muffin um and they're basically tasked with the journey to save christmas but you know there's a, a deep rooted relationship in you know the kind of father daughter dynamic between the therapist and the elf and you know it's a story i'm i'm very proud of because it placed alongside hollywood royalty and shia labeouf um in the socal screenplay competition which i was you know incredibly grateful for um, I'd love to work actively in the screenwriting industry. It would be a, a, just an amazing feat, but 
it's not something that's realistic for me as a 33 year old father that has a business in Australia. Um, but to be able to place alongside a guy like that kind of gives me that credence and that appreciation that, you know, if I pursued it, I may have been able to do it professionally. So yeah, I'm really proud of that. And I really hope something like DreamWorks comes along and picks it up because eventually, Com because it sounds like this would be perfect for Comcast and could go right on the shelf, right next to Elf. It, it definitely, Elf was a great inspiration, particularly for the Penelope Pilly Muffin character. Um, and so I've tried to pull lots of ideas and lots of, you know, inspiration from many great Christmas films of the past. And yeah, it's certainly one that I'll continue to pursue and continue to shop to agents as, as much as possible. Um, but as you know, it's an incredibly difficult industry to break into. So I, uh, I'll continue to do my best though, for sure. Absolutely. So the next one is the Ballad of Bam Barlow. Yes, that's a bit of a tongue twister, isn't it? Yeah, so that's um, it's actually an Australian pilot. Um, it's centered on a, a little bit of a hybrid character. Um, it's probably not going to be too familiar to your audience, but it's basically based on or inspired by an old bush ranger here in Australia named Ned Kelly um, and a famous bush poet by the name of Benjo Patterson. Um, when I say bush ranger, in case anybody doesn't know, it's basically the equivalent of kind of like a cowboy or an outlaw here in Australia. Um, and so this story kind of takes place in the late 1800s um, and follows the son of the convict, who's Van Barlow. Um, and, you know, his desire to leave that life of bush ranging behind. Um, and basically this protagonist in particular goes on this journey uh, with his Indigenous partner, um, so Aboriginal Indigenous partner, um, to try to kind of escape the life and, you know, develop himself as a musician or a bush poet. Um, and as you can probably tell, there's kind of a bit of an inspiration from uh, real life desires for me as a, as a musician here as well. So, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting story. Again, a story about family, um, about love, about pain, um, about, you know, just transformation. And when I write and I write screenplays in particular, I, I certainly try to pay close attention to the themes and the messages that I'm delivering more so than the plots. I just feel it's so much more important to resonate with an audience. Um, and so I'm, I take great caution uh, and consideration in making sure that I can transmit those messages. That's incredible. That's incredible. So Blit Inc. Bliss Inc. Yes. So Bliss Inc. was from last year. That's a, and, and I'm just, I'm genre jumping all over the place here. And, um, you know, I, I certainly have a love for different, for particular genres, but I want it to be as expansive as possible with my portfolio. So this is kind of a bit of a dystopian sci-fi pilot. Um, and it's set in a, in a future, probably not too distant from where we are now. Um, but in a future where happiness can actually be manufactured. And so, you can imagine that opens up a great portal of ideas, right? But it basically follows two kind of unlikely protagonists and their co-workers at the leading company in the field that is manufacturing happiness. Um, and, and they are on a quest to navigate the ethical, legal, personal blurred light implications of their job. And, you know, they're trying to just disrupt the system because as they see it, something isn't quite right at this particular company they're working for. And so, they make it their mission to determine what really is happening here. Um, and again, with this one, this tries to closely parallel the way that we look at the world today. And I think there's a real shift and a downward trend in happiness, right? I mean, I don't know about you, but every second person I speak to, unfortunately, I don't feel doesn't have the same joy that they might have had 15, 20, 30 years ago. And I think that's, you know, quite disheartening. Um, and it's sad to see. And so this story kind of addresses that, but tries to um, tries to wrap a nice neat bow on the top and remind people that in darkness, there always is a flicker of light somewhere. Absolutely, James. Absolutely. And definitely, like, it's definitely like you've hit a nail on the head. The past couple of months have been rough for me mentally, but like roller coaster and the roller coaster rise, but however, at the same time, talking with you, talking with all, connecting with my loved ones, connecting with my friends outside of this whole digital thing has been extremely helpful. And it's so therapeutic to hear, isn't it? We all need to talk to people. I mean, it's we don't do enough of that. We don't reach out to people, friends, family, colleagues. We don't communicate enough. Um, and it's really integral into just maintaining, you know, our um, our emotional well-being and our moral fibre. And I think we, we need to speak to each other more. Um, we need to learn to listen to each other more. And we just need to learn to love each other more. I think there's 
there's so much antagonism and, and so much hate and it's, it's easy. It's easy to be upset, right? It's a lot easier to be angry. It's a lot easier to be hateful, but it takes great courage, I think, to be happy. It takes great courage to be proud. And, you know, I, I think if there's anything that I can say with a lot of the stuff that I do creatively, it's, it's to, to try to transmit without being holier than thou because I'm certainly not perfect. Um, but I, I make it my mission to try to be as close to perfect as I can every day, not only for myself, not only for my business, but certainly for my son and my family. So, yeah, communication is, is, is vital. Absolutely, absolutely. So the last one I'm going to talk about is Tilt. Tilt, yes. So that's my latest screenplay. Um, I finished Tilt, I would say, just before Christmas last year. And this, for very obvious reasons, and I'll share that in a moment, is a very personal story, probably the most personal story I've ever written, um, because it is a father-son dynamic and a father-son relationship. Um, it's basically a road trip kind of golden fleece story set to the background of kind of 1940s New York. Um, and it pulls a lot of real life um, narrative out of that particular time. So at the time, you know, uh, Mayor LaGuardia was in charge of New York and he passed a law outlawing pinball machines. I'm not sure if you're familiar with this at all. This I'm history. not familiar with, unfortunately. Yeah, so out of prohibition, LaGuardia, you know, without kind of, trying to be too political one way or the other, but he was inclined to outlaw pinball machines in a way or as a way to kind of um, disfavor uh, the mob at the time. And so it kind of sounds crazy right now because pinball is pinball, right? But at the time it was considered kind of more detrimental to the younger generation uh, than like a machine gun. It was considered gambling or it was considered kind of a mob racket. And so like, one of my favorite real world quotes that LaGuardia pulled out at the time was something along the lines of, you know, like pinball was more beneficial to, or sorry, it was less beneficial to the social construct of, of New York City than, you know, using it as a recyclable weapon for the war or something. So they were confiscating all these pinball machines and converting them or recycling them into arms, um, which is kind of crazy when you think about it, but that was the thinking back then. Um, but basically this particular story is set to that background and, and follows the story of a widowed um, arcade amusement owner. So he owns a bunch of these pinball machines and he has an autistic son that works with him who has kind of um, unfortunately regressed into a bit of a mute as a result of the passing of his mother. Um, and so he owes the mob a favour as a result of this particular pinball racket that's going on. And so they have to smuggle $100,000 um, across New York um, to Salt Lake City. And so he and his son go on this journey together as a father and son um, to, you know, it's a story of their dynamic, you know, it's sort of tender and sentimental and heartbreaking and hopeful and all the emotions in between. And it really is kind of a, a personal love letter to the father and son dynamic, uh, irrespective of circumstances. And again, it is a reminder that we need to, you know, ensure that we love our loved ones all the time. Yeah. Absolutely. That sounds really good. Now, if Box Studios Australia could come, I mean, Disney Studios Australia can come pick it up, and that would be that would be great. Because the thing is, otherwise, I think it'd be another great thing for Comcast to do for you to film it on Universal Studios lot. It would be a dream, absolutely. It would be a dream. It's uh, just one of those things that I sort of wish I was born in a different place at a different time, and uh, maybe the opportunities would have been different. But it's pretty tough here in Melbourne, Australia, to do these sorts of things when uh, you have. Yeah, American dreams, right? Like that's sort of what I've had my whole life, but I've just been in, was born into the wrong country. And maybe, you know, I, I was very fortunate to, you know, have quite a comfortable lifestyle and have come from a wonderful family and a, and a successful family. And so to leave that behind, to pursue something like that, maybe was a little bit too confronting when I was 17, 18, 19, you know, I'm 33 years old now, so I've changed significantly, but um, I think maybe my lifestyle was too cushy and I didn't take that risk, but I often wonder what life would have been like had I taken that risk in, in music or in writing or in anything. It's definitely something that we've all had to do. Like my trip to New York, like my move to New York City from 2017 to 2021. And yeah, I admit it was great. I had so much fun, got involved, got involved with so many things and got the opportunity to see so many shows and be able to network with people that I never thought I would network. But at the same time, there comes a time when the wallets comes to speak. And when you have- Especially in New York. <laughs> Absolutely. And when you have real life things going on. So 
sometimes you make sometimes we put the right decision. However, we could always we could always go and have that. At the same time, it's also important to have keep to never stop dreaming. And eventually, because the thing is, we look at people like Betty White or like people, so many incredible people that continue to found sex, but have they hit the peak when they were in their 40s or 50s and beyond. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think it's it's certainly important to never, never let that dream out of sight, irrespective of circumstance, because our lives change so often, right? I mean, every day and every week and every month is a new adventure. Um, and so to kind of have an objective or a goal to always work towards, irrespective of what your circumstances are, I think it's important, even if we never get there, I think it's always important to dream. Um, and if we don't find ways to keep those dreams alive, I don't know about others, but I, I start to lose some of that purpose and that meaning, right? I mean, I'm fortunate to have a family and that takes, that, that is my meaning now, but you know, my whole life I've always dreamt. And so I try to make sure I continue to dream and I stay dreaming as much as I can. Absolutely. Same with me. Same with me. So speaking of music, we have, we could not end our conversation without talking about music. So of in, as of the, as of this recording, as of this recording, um, you have come, you have co-produced Emmanuel Dionda's latest song, Body, which will be released on October 25th. So could you describe the song to my audience? Absolutely. Well, before I jump into that, I will mention that there is one additional song that I have coming out after the fact. And again, it allows me to explore the elements of AI. Um, I mentioned to you that I have decades plus worth of music sitting on my hard drives. Um, and so with some of the latest platforms, we're able to ingest some of those songs and some of those beats that I've made for many, many years and generate vocals, authentic sounding vocals through that technology, which is as a producer um, that doesn't have an infinite amount of musicians to work with and vocalists to work with, it's just an incredible resource. And so I actually have a Christmas song, as I often like to do, um, coming out in the beginning of December called Feels Like Christmas. Um, and it's a beat that I made in the middle of last year, not an AI beat. It's obviously completely original. And, you know, as a, as a trained musician and as a musician that's been doing this forever, I don't think I'll ever be able to necessarily generate music through AI, but to generate vocals with AI that work with my beats is a really amazing experience. Um, and so I have that coming out in December, which is really awesome. Um, but on Emmanuel DeAnda's song, and of course, Manny is how I affectionately know him. Um, body was really interesting because it was kind of a, a different experience for me. Normally, everything that I produce from beginning to end, 95% of it um, isn't co-produced or co-written with anybody else, really. It's kind of my original idea. Um, in this scenario, I was more of a co-producer. Manny did all the heavy lifting and really produced all the, the fundamental concepts and ideas in the beat. And I believe he worked with a co-writer. We, like we have a guitarist on the record. Uh, another producer that played some of the bass lines. Um, so that was really great. I kind of had like a, a demo or an initial version of the track to begin to work with. Um, and as I kind of dissected that and analyzed it a little bit, I rewrote some of the drum progressions, changed the, I changed the progression in the bridge, I added some additional instrumentation to the chorus. Um, we rewrote a whole new outro for the track, which is kind of like a super funky reverse tempo. Um, you know, just a really interesting interpretation on what the chorus was doing. Um, and so it was really cool to kind of uh, enter that production as more of like a polisher producer than an in a conceiving or an inception producer. Uh, so that was a lot of fun. And I have to give Manny a really big shout out. You know, I've met so many people in the music industry over so many years, but Emmanuel DeAnda is my favorite collaborator of all time. You know, he's a wonderful, incredible vocalist um, and really just one of the best human beings you could ever hope to meet in this industry. And so... You know, I'm glad to have the opportunity to work with Manny again. Um, and yeah, like you said, it, it comes out on October 25th and you, know, you can pre-save that on Spotify and The Body by Emmanuel Deander. Um, But depending on how we go, we might have a few more things in store for people just depending on whether or not we can get our stuff together in time. But yeah, it's um, we certainly are in constant communication, Manny and I, and we just uh, we both are at a stage in life where we love making music um, you know, but we feel really passionate about the style of music and the genre of music that we're working in. And so we just try to keep ourselves and we try to motivate each other. We try to inspire each other and we just try to create as often as we can, which unfortunately isn't all that often at the moment, but you know, we're doing our best to try to, yeah, build the building blocks and to develop new concepts and ideas every day. 
Absolutely, absolutely. So we got to start winding down our conversation, James. So what have what have been your favorite social media apps to use and to connect with people? Yeah, great question. So I look in terms of connecting, Instagram is probably the best place to find me. You can find me just at James Sismanis, which is J-A-M-E-S-S-I-S-M-A-N-E-S. Um, I'm on Twitter quite frequently, but I, if I'm being honest, I use that really to keep on tabs with my sports teams. <laughs> and <use. laughs> uh, I should say X. I mean, I've always said Twitter since forever, but you know what I mean? I still yeah, use Twitter. Inst- of course, Instagram, Twitter X is, is kind of where I'm at. I'm on Facebook every now and then, I guess, but, um, funnily enough, I'm, I'm not a TikTok guy. Are you a TikTok guy? I try my best, but however, I have not have had as much of success as I have on Instagram I, or Twitter. I gotcha. I feel like TikTok is a real reminder that I'm a dad. I feel really, really outdated and disconnected with the concept of TikTok. Um, and, you know, I think I've jumped on it every now and then, but I don't know. It's not, it's not my cup of tea. I, uh, it, I like the creative process behind the scenes more so than in front of the camera. So it's, uh, yeah, but I know it's a really popular medium and a popular platform. What, um, what's your preferences? Where do you kind of, what's your go-to social media app? I gotta say my go-to social media app is Instagram and, and threads and Twitter. Those, and of course, YouTube. So those, we'll get to those and you'll find, you'll find them soon. However, last question, James, are you ready? Oh, nail it. All righty. So if they're interested in finding your work and purchasing some books, where yes. can my audience do that? Yes, everywhere and anywhere. So Amazon, obviously, as we know, is just the behemoth of a retailer. So you can certainly find the marvelous Muller Blues only wear blue on Amazon. You can find it at Barnes and Noble. You can find it at Walmart. Uh, I know your audience predominantly is, is American, so that's kind of your, you know, am I missing? They're kind of your main big ones, aren't they? Really in the US? Oh yeah, my American. Yeah, imagine the US is constantly yeah. my top audience. Number one. Absolutely. So yeah, look, anywhere globally you can find it. Um, we have a couple of different, uh, I mean, you can grab it as an ebook, you can grab it as a, as a paperback, you can grab it as a hardback, but yeah, I'd say Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Walmart, they're kind of your best, uh, best approaches for sure. And you can also find it at jamesismanis.com.au, I should say. Awesome. So guys, have you missed an episode of the Jake's Take with Jacob Elliott podcast? Visit our channels on Amazon Music, Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Podchaser, Spotify, and Spreaker. Jake's Take with Jacob Elliott Shower, J A C O B E L Y A C H A R. Now, are you on social media? Because I'm on social media too Facebook, Instagram, Threads, Twitter, TikTok, and YouTube. Jacob Elliott Shower, J A C O B E L Y A C H A R. And you want to see my take on James's music under Simi and our earlier conversations, visit jakes-take.com. Once again, jakes-take.com. James, thank you so much for being part of my milestone fifth anniversary season. I am very thank honored you, and friend. proud of all of what have you accomplished. And you, my friend, are incredible. Likewise. And I'm so grateful to be here. I'm so, you know, glad that I've been able to follow your journey for so many years. And it's so wonderful to see you doing awesome things. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for allowing me to be part of this. And to your audience, thank you for supporting the book when you get the opportunity. I'm very appreciative of all your support. Awesome. And guys, thank, as always, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time, have a great one, everybody. Good. Bye.